So now it's time for the third chapter of CCNA3 version 6 with me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Skövde. And the topic for this lecture is the Spanning 3 protocol. Um, and what we're actually going to look at is uh, LAN redundancy, how you can build redundancy in a local area network that has already been discovered using multiple sets of equipment, using redundant link and all of that. But uh, there are some issues concerning LAN redundancy that we're going to discuss. Uh, the solution for most of those issues is called Spanning 3 Protocol or STP. And we're going to look at the Spanning 3 algorithm, the purpose of Spanning 3, and some of the different modes that you can configure STP to work in. Uh, as for the practical part, we're going to do uh, one short demonstration in Packet Tracer of how Spanning Tree works in action, and we're going to do a configuration task. As always, pause me if I'm too much and going too quick, and uh, please make sure that you do the practicals either before or after my demonstration to really make sure that what you're learning in theory gets stuck in practice as well. Okay, so let's begin with looking at uh, some considerations with local area network redundancy. Uh, as we did, as we explored, when you design your network, you do want to implement redundant links because you don't want to have every host that is connected to one switch totally fail if the switch link to the upper layer fails. So you do this by having two or more connections to upper layers, but this comes with issues. Uh, the issues uh, are uh, MAC database instability, broadcast storms, multiple frame transmission, and more. And those issues are all possible because the Ethernet L2 frames does not uh, does not have a time to live attribute. So if you're setting an IP packet, packet and it's get, it gets trapped into a loop, it's going to uh, die eventually because it has a time to live field that gets counted down at every route it passes and eventually time to live will be zero and it's going to be disappeared. That is not present in uh, with the Ethernet or the layer two frames. Uh, so from a logical view, it's important that there is only one switch drought between any two nodes and Spanning 3 will help create that. The issue of course is that when you have redundancy, you do have different uh, do, uh, you have multi multiple routes by by design, so you really need spanning three, um, and in essence, spanning three is a protocol that dynamically will disable ports to create a loop-free topology. So the idea is that if you do have two ways to reach the same host, uh, spanning three will make sure that only one of those are active, and if one link fails, STP will re recalculate the topology and enable the uh, one of the other links. <clears throat> so, in short, what Spanning Tree does, or the Spanning Tree algorithm, is that it begins with electing one, uh, one switch in the topology as a root bridge, uh, and that this is the bridge with the lowest bridge ID, we're going to get into that, and what happens then is that all other switches will calculate the best path to the road bridge and use the best possible connections. So switch port used for the best path are activated and the rest are disabled. So uh, what happens is that you will not use the redundant link and uh, your links will not be your redundant link will not be up or, or at least not all of them. But if one of the active link fails, then one of the uh, the disabled link will, will take its place. So before we move into how this works, we're going to have to look at a sample topology. So what I want to show you in this little topology before we go into the terminology is to show you uh, is to show you the issue. So what would happen if if PC3 wants to send a package to PC1? What would happen from the beginning is that PC3 would send a package to switch 1. The switch 1 is not yet aware of the existence of PC1 and will broadcast the package out all ports. So it will go to switch 3, it will go to switch 1, and it will also go to PC1. Um, then PC1 gets the package, but so, so does switch 3 and switch 1. Switch 3 does not know about, uh, about PC1 either, so it's going to broadcast the package again, and it's going back to switch 2. Now switch 2 will know about PC1, so it's going to uh, put the package back to PC1. Uh, so this is one alternative. The, this is something that would be a problem, and therefore we need to have we need to have our al our uh, have a way to disable those ports. So looking from PC4, right now there is two ways to reach 
the network connected to switch 2. When a package comes to switch 1, it can either go to switch 3, then switch 2, or it can go directly to switch 2 and then down to the PCs in the switch 2 network. So that's the what P, what STP wants to do is make sure that one of those links gets disabled so that there is only one loop free path. So for the terminology, we have some words that we need to know about. First, we have the root bridge, and that is the switch that gets elected as the master of the STP domain. That's the switch that will be the root of all uh, of all cal STP calculations, sort of the reference point. Uh, then we have the root ports, and those are ports. Uh, on each switch that de that dictate the best route to the root bridge. So if we look at s uh, the topology here, we see that switch one is the root bridge, and since switch three uh, on switch three the F01 interface is the best route to the root bridge, then this interface becomes the root port. Uh, and then we have designated ports, which are all other ports that are allowed to forward traffic. Uh, and basically you can say that in most cases designated port is the opposite of a root port. That's not always true, but uh, the opposite of a root port will at least always be designated. And one thing to notice is that root bridge will, all, will always have all the ports being designated. And then we have the alternate port, which is a backup port that is blocked uh, to create a loop free topology. And that is one of the ports with uh, that's that's the port with uh, with least uh, least good path to the root bridge, and we can also have disabled ports. And in STP terminology, a disabled port is a port that has been manually shut down. Uh, and the disabled ports will of course not be enabled if uh, by STP because it's been shut down using the shutdown command. Uh, so. Looking a little bit into the root bridge. Uh, the root bridge will be the reference point for all STP calculations. All switches in a broad, uh, all switches in the broadcast domain will participate in the election to become the root bridge. So when everything starts up, when your switch is booted and all of that, then there will be an election taking place to elect the root bridge for the STP domain. And the election is based on the bridge ID, which is a configur uh, configurable value and the switch with the lowest bridge ID will win, and if there are two or more switches with the same bridge ID, the lowest MAC address will win. So looking back on the topology here, what happens during boot time was that there was an election taking place, and for some reason, switch one had the lowest bridge ID and won the election and became the root bridge. So that's it for how the root bridge is selected. Uh, next, we have the uh, selecting best path. So how is this done? Well, to begin with, every link has an STP cost, and the cost is based on the link speed, and the best path is simply calculated by summing the total cost to the root bridge. Uh, so the default cost is based on link speed, but it can also be manu manually configured using the interface command spanning tree cost and some value that you want to have. And in the uh, current revised specification of spanning tree, uh, the costs are, as you can see in the table below, so if you have a 10 gigabit link, the cost is 2, if you have a 1 gigabit link, the cost is 4, and so on and so forth. And if we just go back to the topology again, I want to show you how this works. So this is a, let's go back, fast ethernet, <coughs> um, port, one, uh, 100 megabit port, and what happens here is that the cost for this, for every one of those is 19. So for S3 to reach, reach, reach the root bridge, it has this one, this way, which will cost 19, and it will have this way, which will be 19 plus 19. If those two, uh, so here we have the 19, here we have 19 plus another 19, so this is going to be deactivated, and this will be the root port. So if this was... If this was a gigabit link and this was a gigabit link or 10 gigabit links, then the cost would be 2 plus 2. So the equal cost of, cost of going this path would be 4. Then this line would actually be disabled because this path would be cheaper. Okay, so moving on. Um, when we talk about STP, we, we talk about BP, BPDU frames. And BPDU frames are the frames used by... Uh, by STP to elect a root bridge and subsequently the port rules. And it contains two things. It contains the sending switches bridge ID. So 
by examining a BPDU from a neighboring switch, the switch will know uh, which one of those devices that should uh, that should be uh, take precedence in the election of the root bridge. It also includes the path cost indicating the distance to the road root bridge. So initially during boot up all switches will consider themselves root but uh, but when a switch get a BPDU indicating that another switch has a lower bridge ID it will consider that switch to be the root and this is a process that will repeat itself BPDUs will be flooded within the domain and uh, after a while all switches will agree on one root bridge uh, so you should also note that the bridge ID portion of the BPDU includes an extended system ID portion and that is reserved for VLAN information uh, so this is quite briefly on STP. I would urge you to read up a little bit more in the, in the theoretical CCNA material to really grasp it. Uh, but for now, I just want to have a quick look in Packet Tracer of how STP uh, works and what it does for us in practice. So for this uh, little practical, we're just gonna have to have a look on the topology. And as you see, there is a abundance of switches and there is a lot of links and there are uh, and there are links blinking in different colors. And what is happening here, just look at how packet tracer work. Uh, if there is a green, green dots on both sides of the link, that means that the link is up and running. But uh, as far as STP terminology goes, uh, the green lights will indicate a root port or a designated port while the red little orange dots will uh, will indicate a uh, um, a alternate port so what we're going to do here is basically to send a ping message from pc6 to pc1 and what i anticipate is that the ping will go from pc6 to the switch up here to the um, to d3 uh, on towards c1 and then down using the uh, the routes with green lights all the way and that is because you see here there is an orange light indicating that this is a path that has been shut down by uh, by spanning green so i'm going to do this in simulation mode so that we can actually watch how the packet traverses and uh, so what we do is that we take a, a simple pdu here and we click pc6 and we click pc1 and this is the equivalent of sending a ping but now we can actually look at it more more in detail so let it run as you see it goes up to a4 then it goes up to d3 and so on and so forth there are some broadcasting happening and as you will see eventually it's going to be drilled down all the way to pc1 so that's all i want for that we're not going to wait for it so we're just going to delete it and now something that i just want to show you is to verify this um, this configuration wise so let's just look real quickly at a6 here and we want to do enable and we're going to do show spanning three and as you can see here there is three ports fa1 2 and 3 where uh, fa02 is the root port so that should be this port here and then we have a designated down here and then we have the alternate port which should be this one fa01 and um, Exactly, and that is because spanning tree has chosen to disable this port. Now what I want to try to do is go back to real-time mode and we're going to disable or remove this link and we're going to see that spanning tree is going to recalculate the path. So I'm going to do fast forward time here because I don't, I'm not much for waiting. And you can see that this link becomes all green. And if we go back into A6 and we go um, and we go show spending three again, you can see that now FA01 is the root port. So if we again do the simulation with the PDU, you will be able to see that of course the, uh, the package will take the now only existent route uh, or the existent path, which is what you're saying in switching term terminology, and it's going to reach the end, which is PC1. So this was uh, how uh, from the beginning you, you had redundant links from A6 here and you had spanning tree shutting down one of them but when uh, one of the links uh, or the active link was removed then the link that was still existent was used and STP made it for us. So that is sort of the power of STP. Uh, of course, you may say that, well, having redundant links and turning some of them off, that's a waste of resources, but we're going to see later how we can 
uh, how we can utilize that. Uh, so, getting back to the theory, we're going to have a closer look at different types of spanning tree mode and how to configure spanning tree on our own. Uh, so, beginning the listing, there is a multitude of different versions of spanning tree, beginning with 802.1D 1998, which is the standard legacy for bridging an STP. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of those, but what you need to know is that there are basically two flavors on how you can implement uh, STP. Either you implement STP for for the entire network, or you can uh, or you can implement uh, spanning three on a per VLAN basis. And the thing is that when you implement spanning three on a per VLAN basis, you can select different root bridge for different VLANs, and that allows. Uh, the root ports and uh, especially the alternate ports to be different in uh, in between the different VLANs. So data will take different paths depending on which VLAN it's being sent on, making you able to utilize all links, even if some links are shut down for some VLANs. Uh, so some of the protocols that I want to highlight is first uh, RSTP, which is, stands for Rapid STP, which is basically per uh, an STP flavor where you configure STP for uh, for all VLANs at the same time and it works the same, the root bridge is the same for all VLANs. It's, uh, however, it's false to converge and that is something that you want to achieve. Uh, so that means false to converge means, th means that election of root bridge and the port rules will happen quickly. Uh, then we have the Cisco specific PVSTP and rapid PVSTP and PVST or PVST is basically per VLAN S STP allowing you to do what I just said and have different root bridges for different uh, for different VLANs. There is also MSTP that allows you to group uh, VLANs into instances and have different uh, STP sessions and different root bridges running for different instances. Uh, so we're going to look more on the, the Cisco specific PVST and rapid PVST in this course. So beginning with PVST or PVST plus, that's per VLAN STP. And as I said, that's, uh, that allows for better utilization of links as one spanning tree algorithm is executed for each VLAN. And that allows for different root bridges and trees for different VLANs. Uh, however, it does generate more load on the CPU, at least combined within the domain, uh, because we have more STP, uh, STP uh, processes running. And we use the extended system ID portion of the bridge ID to ensure unique, a unique bid for each, uh, for each VLAN. And as you see in the sample topology here, we have one route for VLAN 20 and we have another route for VLAN 10. And on switch 2, uh, F03 will be the forwarding port for VLAN 20. And uh, switch and F FA02 will be the forwarding port for VLAN 10. So that means that uh, on S2 this, the traffic will take different paths depending on which VLAN the traffic is to be sent on. Uh, so we're going to look at the port states for PVST just to have a um, an overview. Unfortunately, the ports are named a little bit different than standard STP. They're called blocking, listening, learning, f and forwarding. Uh, a blocking port is a port that can receive and process BPTUs, but it cannot forward data frames. It cannot forward uh, frames from other interfaces and it will not learn MAC addresses from incoming frames. Uh, the same is for listening ports. Uh, the difference here is that listening ports are ports that is in the process of, uh, of participating in the, piece, uh, in the STP calculations. Uh, so then we have learning ports and those are ports that are currently learning about the uh, about the STP instance. Those can also receive and process uh, BPDUs. They cannot form forward frames, uh, but they can learn MAC addresses. And then we have the forwarding ports, and that is ports that are uh, sending traffic. And disabled ports are ports that has been manually disabled again. Uh, there is also rapid PVST, which is an enhanced version of PVST that allows for faster convergence. Uh, and the thing here is that there is no blocked port. Instead, they are called alternate or discarding. And 
And uh, what is the thing with this port is that it can become a forwarding port without having to wait for the network to converge. So if there is a switch that has two paths to the root bridge and the primary part is uh, breaks down for some reason, then uh, Rapid PVST will uh, quickly set the discarding port into a forwarding state. Uh, so when we go into configuration. There are two things that we're going to that I'm going to tell you about, and those are Portfest and BPDU Guard, and those are two nice features that allows for uh, the uh, the spending tree process to work smoother, if you will. Portfest that's a feature that allows that that you configure on an access port, and that ensures that the access port will immediately transition into a forwarding state without having to participate in the spanning tree calculations. So if there is a port that is in access mode and connected to hosts, you can con configure them with Portfast and that will uh, allow them to be, uh, to be in a forwarding state immediately when the switch bo boots up. Uh, we also have BPDU Guard, which is a security feature that you configure an edge port, and it closes the port if it receives a BPDU. And the idea here is that if you have an access port that should be connected to an end device, and it receives a BPDU package, then that's a sign of something being being weird. Maybe someone is trying to insert a root switch into the network that should do something to the spanning, uh, spanning tree topology or whatever, and then the switch will close the port automatically. So whenever you have, uh, whenever you're working with STP, you should remember to enable BP, BP, BPDU guard and port fast on all access ports. Uh, so let's go into some configuration of uh, Rapid PVST, which is uh, really the flavor of STP that you should use on Cisco devices. If you have a multi-vendor environment, you should consider using MSTP instead. Uh, so this is basically some 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 of the some of, some of the default switch configurations. When you enable it, it's an uh, it's enabled by default for VLAN one, and uh, the sp spanning tree mode is PVST plus. This default priority for a um, a spanning a rapid PVST plus switch is thirty two thousand seven hundred and. 68 remember that when you set the priority for for a switch for the root bridge selection you have to set it in multiples of 4096 and the spanning tree port priority is 128 and that it, and the spanning tree port priority will influence what links that becomes active when there are equal cost cost links uh, you can also see the spanning tree default port costs for 1000 megabit links, it's 4, 400 megabit links, it's 19, and for 10 megabit links, it's 100. Um, and it's the same when you have spanning tree VLAN ports and the timers. You can also see that uh, spanning tree or rapid PVST is sending hello packages to, to neighboring switches every two seconds. Uh, and the maximum aging time is 20 seconds. So if the maximum aging time is being achieved, then the switch will consider the neighbor to be down and the link to be down. So let's just have a practical look on how to configure spanning tree. And then we're going to come back and discuss switch stacking just, uh, real quick. Uh, and remember that when we're looking at spanning tree, there are a lot of details on how to configure what priority priorities to use and so on and so forth and you have to read up on those a little bit before you have a, uh, a theoretical quiz in this course however what we're going to do now in the practical should cover what you really need to know to make a proper implementation of rapid uh, pvst so let's get get going with packet tracer So there we are in Packet Tracer. So there is a couple of things that we're going to do with our little topology here. First, we're going to create VLANs and do proper assignments of VLANs for the ports on switch two. Then we're going to uh, configure rapid spanning tree uh, with rapid, rapid PVST. And we're going to also configure port fast and BPDU guard. So let's just get down dirty and configure the VLANs. And why not do it using uh, VTP just for and uh, just for practice, I'm in this case going to do switch two and three cl as clients and switch one as as the server. 
So remember that what we have to do is go into configuration terminal and then we go VTP mode client VTP domain CCNA VTP password Cisco. That's our first client. Let's do switch three configuration terminal. VTP mode client, that did not work, VTP mode client, VTP um, domain CCNA, VTP password Cisco, then we go to switch one, which should be our server, and we go to configuration terminal, VTP mode server, VTP domain CCNA, VTP password Cisco. So that's VTP for us. And now let's see, we should do uh, VLANs uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 99. Oh, 10, 20, 30, 40. 50, 60, 70, 80, and 99. So let's just verify that switch two got him. Okay, that worked very well. Uh, I'm guessing that the issue here is the next thing that says that we have to assign the trunks to native VLAN 99, so let's do that. And that is ports F01 to F04 on each switch, so interface range FA0124, switch port mode trunk, and switch port trunk native VLAN 99. And we'll redo that on the other switches. Uh, interface range FA0124 switch port mode trunk switch port trunk native VLAN 99 has to be spelled right and then yes to be cool on switch 3 we're going to do interface range FA0124 Four, and we're going to do switch port mode dynamic desirable that should cause them to go into trunking mode because there is a trunk on the other end and we had no negotiate somewhere so again we just do trunk switch mode switch port trunk native v199 so we're gonna fast forward time a little bit for vtp transactions to happen and just going to ensure that it did happen by doing a do show VLAN brief. So now we did some VLANs using VTP and we tried to do some trunks using DTP but failed miserably, miserably because someone did no negotiate on, one, on, on the switches and uh, so we did it manually and we set the native VLAN to be 99 so that uh, on all switches so we have matching native VLANs and uh, so it, then it wants us to configure management interface we're not going to do that we're going to dig into configure spanning tree so if we just start looking at switch one uh, we can do an end and we can do show spanning tree to just look at the current mode so you will see that we have spanning tree and spanning tree enabled protocol IEEE. What we want is to change that to, so that we have um, rapid PVST and we do that by the command spanning tree mode rapid PVST. And if we do our show spanning tree, do show spanning tree, uh, you will see that 
uh, we will now have spanning tree enable protocol RSTP. So first thing we have to do is configure that on all switches. So spanning tree mode rapid uh, rapid BVST and on switch three spanning tree mode mode rapid PVST and now that's done. Um, and the next thing it wants us to do is that we should configure S1 to be the root bridge for VLAN 1, 10, 30, and 50, and 70. So then we can do this in a number of different ways. And uh, so now if you do, if we do our do show spanning tree, you'll see that we will have one instance of spanning tree running for every VLAN if we just browse through this. And we want to configure so that we have a different root bridge for different VLANs. And we're going to do this by, uh, by using the configuration spanning tree and we'll see what we can do. So spanning tree, VLAN, then the different VLANs that we want. Here we can either type down VLANs as a range. So this will be VLAN 10 to 20, so 10, 11, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so, so on. But now we only want to have some, and then we can do them comma separated. So we should do 1, 10, 20, 30, and 50. And then we can either do root, uh, primary, or secondary. What that will do is that it will automatically set the priority so that this device becomes the primary root for the spanning three instances for these VLANs. The, how it will do that is that it will check the, uh, the bridge ID of the current root and then select a uh, priority value that is one step below the current root. And thus, this switch will become root. And the other way to do it is that we do uh, priority and then assign a priority value in increments of 4096. So in this case, we'll go 4096. And that should be it. And we can ver verify that it worked by doing spanning, uh, show spanning three, and do show spanning three. We can add a VLAN number to it. So we go show spanning three. Okay, let's do end show spanning three VLAN 10. And you can see here that this bridge is the root. And you will also see that the priority differs a little bit from the priority value that you set. And that is because the priority is made up from the bridge ID and the extended system ID. So if you look at the bridge ID here, the, pr uh, the priority value is 4106. And that is made up from the priority 4096 and the extended system ID, which is 10, because this is VLAN 10. So if we were to look for 20, you can see that the priority is 10 more, namely 4116, because the priority is still 4096 and the extended system ID is 20. So let's go do some, uh, uh, decide on some root bridge stuff for switch three. This time we're gonna do spanning three. VLAN uh, 60, 70, 80, and 99, if I'm correct. And we're going to do root primary. So in this case, when we go back and we do show spanning three VLAN 50, you can see that the, uh, okay, I did something wrong, uh, 60 then. Uh, you can see that the priority value here is uh, 24576 plus the se extended system ID. And that is because the default priority is 32,000 something. And now it is just one step lower so that it ensures that this switch will become the root. Uh, so that's it for the root. We, we uh, for root bridge, now we configured rapid spanning tree by uh, doing spanning tree mode rapid PVST and then we configured the root bridges first by doing spanning three 
uh, and root primary, and then uh, and we also did it using spanning three priority and hard coding the priority value. And I'm sure you understand the difference between those two, and that is that when you do root primary, it's going to look at the lowest priority out in topology and set the uh, set the value for the local bridge to be an increment of 4096 lower than the current and thus ensuring that it will become the root. But if we hard code, it's going to be whatever priority value that we hard code. So ending up, we're going to look through switch three and we're going to uh, do some port fast and BPDU guard and that is an X port uh, configuration. So what we're going to do first is that we're going to do uh, interface uh, range FAO 6 to 18 that covers all of our access ports and we're going to do uh, switch port mode access to put them in access mode and then we actually have to, uh, to do exit and we have to do interface FAO6 and that's going to be switch port access VLAN 30 and then we're going to do 11 which is going to be VLAN 10 and then we're going to do 18 and switch port access VLAN 20. So now we assigned the access ports to the correct VLANs and uh, we're going to do interface uh, range FA 06 to 18 again because that covers all of those ports. Uh, we're going to do no shutdown because they appear to be uh, disabled. So now you can see that they're enabled. And then finally, we're going to do spending spending three port first uh, and enter. And what happens now is that. Uh, port fast will be enabled so that whenever those ports are in access mode they will be forwarding ports immediately when the switch boots and then we're also going to do spanning tree uh, bpdu guard enable and that allows or that ensures that whenever if those access ports would get bpdu uh, package they will be disabled because uh, access ports should not receive bpdu uh, packages uh, and remember that both BPU guard and port fast is something that is configured on access ports and on the interface level and not from uh, global configuration mode. So I guess this is it for this demonstration. Let's go back to the theory and just discuss switch stacking really quick before we end. Uh, as always, if I'm moving too quick, you should pause me. Maybe you should pause me now to do the PVST and rapid PVST practicals on your own and follow the Cisco rules because I'm not really doing that when I'm doing the demonstrations. Uh, and if you have questions, ask me if you're in class or write it in the comments field and I will try to ask, uh, answer it as best I can. So uh, let's look a little bit about uh, on switch stacking. Uh, and switch stacking, that basically means that you connect different switches together and make them act as one. So when you stack switches, one switch in the stack will be elected the master and all configuration is maintained and performed on the master. So let's say that you have four uh, 24 port switches and you stack them together. One will be the master where you do the configuration and essentially you will have a 96 port switch. So the benefit here is that there is only one device to manage, but, but it allows you for, to have a switch with more port, ports than a switch would normally have. Uh, and the domain of STP, uh, in the domain of STP, stacking can be a way to get more switch ports without increasing the number of switches in the STP area, because the stacked switch or all the stacked switches will be seen as one. So I'm also going to tell you about some, uh, some troubleshooting tips. So first we have show CDP neighbors, which is a way to use the Cisco discovery protocol to view the topology as it's seen by a device. Uh, as we did in the practical, you also have show spanning tree to view a summary of spanning tree information for, uh, for all VLANs. And you have sp show spanning tree VLAN and a VLAN number to show the spanning tree information for a specific VLAN. Some spelling errors here, but whatever. Uh, so I'm just going to see if I have the practical left. I'm going to show you how share what, what you could expect with uh, with those different show commands. So we're on switch two again, and if I just go uh, and so that I get to privileged executive mode, I'm going to start by demonstrating show CDP uh, neighbors. 
And basically what, it, what that command does is that it outputs what devices that are connected to the switch on what ports. Uh, you can e even see what platform it is uh, and stuff like that. And this is actually a layer two protocol that uh, that enables you to see if devices are actually in connection with each it, with each other at all, and it can be useful for uh, for communication or for troubleshooting. However, you should know that you should use CDP with care because when you're configuring it, you have to ensure that you configure it so that no one can input a CDP-enabled device into your uh, into your network and read the CDP information from your devices because that would be a security issue. So if I do show spending tree again, just to show you, uh, as we said, you get all of those information for all different VLANs. Actually, you can use show spending three VLAN 99 to only filter out one, one VLAN. And what you get here is first, the spending tree version that is running. In this case, RSTP, which is indicated with, uh, which is uh, rapid PVST. You see the root ID and uh, name what device that is the root bridge and uh, the priority of the root bridge the mac address to the root, root bridge the cost to reach the root bridge and uh, uh, what port that is used to uh, what port it can be accessed on and you also see hello time max aging time and so on and so forth and then you have information for your own device your priority your mac address and then you have the different interfaces that are participating in the STB process. And in this case, you can see that we have one root bridge and we have three alternate ports that is not used to forward traffic. So that was it for this chapter on spanning three. I hope you learned something and I hope you at least bared through it. See you next time when we're going to discuss first up redundancy and eat the channel. Bye.